Welcome to the Apostolic Keynote Podcast from Kingdom Faith Church. This message is by Colin Urquhart. Jesus gave a series of wonderful promises concerning prayer and the answers to prayer. One of those from John 16, verse 23, says, I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. we we'll read that again. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Now, that's a very comprehensive promise that you will receive from the Father whatever you ask in the name of Jesus. So that poses the question, well, what does it really mean to ask in the name of Jesus? Then Jesus says that until that time, the disciples had not asked or been able to ask even for anything in his name. Why was that? What was so different that before they could not ask for anything in his name, now they can ask for anything and whatever they ask will be given them. Ask and you will receive that your joy will be complete. Now, of course, these are not the only prayer promises that Jesus made. Uh, He gives various promises throughout his ministry. But these promises that we read in chapters 14, 15, 16 of John's Gospel take place within the context of the Last Supper. And you know that at that time, what Jesus is teaching the disciples is that he is the true vine. They are branches in the vine. The Father is the vine dresser, the gardener, who cares for the vine. And we've had a lot of teaching in recent weeks uh, about that. Paul was to say some years later, whatever you do in the name of Jesus, or whatever you do in word or deed, you are to do in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, Jesus says, you have been put into the vine as a branch. Remain there, stay there, rest there. And God has been speaking to us these last few days about how as we rest in him, remain in him, so it's the job of the vine to produce the fruit through the branches. What's the connection between speaking in his name, acting in his name, and praying in his name? Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Now, the name, of course, in scripture denotes the person. These prayer promises are given to those who remain in the vine, abide in the vine, rest in the vine. How do you do that? Well, Jesus said, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love in the vine, just as I obeyed my father's commands and obeyed in his love, uh, remained in his love. So here we see that what Jesus is saying and what Paul is obviously agreeing with Jesus is that this is a package. 
if you speak in his name and you act in his name, you can pray in his name. And when you pray in his name, God will then give you whatever you ask in his name. So these prayer promises of praying in his name can't be divorced from whatever it means to speak in his name and to act in his name. So we're going to have to come back and see what that actually means in a moment. How can we pray in Jesus? And why, had it not been possible for the disciples to pray in the name of Jesus before he made this statement? What Jesus is doing at the Last Supper is talking not about the past relationship that the disciples have had with him, but the future relationship they will have once he has gone to the cross and made his life a sacrifice for them, had been raised from the dead, returned to the glory of heaven, and the Holy Spirit has been poured out. So we know that in that whole work of what is called redemption, of God redeeming us, paying the price for us so that we could belong to him as his children, Jesus did a perfect, finished, completed work to which nothing could be added. So the work of salvation or that would enable salvation for men to be saved and brought back into relationship with God, to know him as father, to be fully accepted by him and to become the children of God was fully accomplished by Jesus. We know that. So what is Jesus doing now? The scripture tells us he's doing two things. On the one hand, he has accomplished all that he was sent to do. So he is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, just waiting for all his enemies to be put under his feet, waiting for the time when the Father will tell him to come again, not this time as a suffering servant, but as the triumphant king. So in that sense, Jesus has finished the work of redemption, finished the work of salvation that he was sent to accomplish. But what is he actually doing? I mean, surely he's not sitting in heaven or standing in the midst of heaven as the lamb in the midst of the throne, however you want to visualize him, doing nothing. No, far from it. Jesus is constantly active. And we see what he's doing in Hebrews chapter 7. Here in Hebrews, the writer talks about Jesus as our high priest. The high priest was the one, you remember, who went into the Holy of Holies carrying the sacrifice to pray for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. So Jesus was the high priest who returned to heaven having made the sacrifice with his own blood that would make it possible for the sins of all mankind to be forgiven. So he was the high priest, but he was also the sacrifice. He was also the sacrifice by which all men are saved. So his work of salvation made it possible for all men to be saved. Now, he knows that not all will be saved because not all will turn to him in repentance and faith. But what he did on the cross was for the whole of mankind, 
not just for those who will become believers. But what is he doing in heaven? Well, it says here in Hebrews 7, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede. Now, we would say, well, that's because he has completed the work of salvation through the cross and resurrection, his return to glory. But no, no, that's not what this verse is saying. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So what is Jesus doing now in heaven? He is interceding. Now, many of you will know that to intercede, people usually describe that as standing in the gap. If you imagine we're using this chair to represent the throne of God in heaven, and where you are, here is sinful mankind. Mm -hmm. Now, between sinful mankind and the glory of heaven, there is only one mediator. There's only one person who can stand in the gap. There's only one person who can intercede. And that is Jesus. He is interceding continually. Now, what does that mean? He has completed, if we say, here is Jesus in his humanity here. He has completed the work of salvation. He has made it possible for people now to be made one with God the Father in heaven. But you see, just because he has completed the work, that doesn't make anybody become a new creation. It means he's done for them all that is necessary for that to be possible. But now he's praying for all those or for people to lay hold of the salvation that he has won. He is praying for lost souls to take hold of that salvation. He is interceding with the Father for all those who repent and turn to him. And we'll see what he's praying for them in a moment because the scripture shows us. So there is constant prayer going on in Jesus. You know that when we worship, we don't initiate worship. We join with the worship that is going on all the time in heaven. Now, if we properly understand intercession, we realize we are not standing in the gap between sinful humanity and God the Father. We can't do that. We are not mediators. There's only one mediator, Jesus Christ. But when we intercede, what God is calling us to do is to join in the intercession of Jesus. Why? Because now we're living in him and he in us. And God sees us in seated in heavenly places that we may intercede or join with him in his intercession for sinful humanity and to disciple all those who turn to him. Are you with me? So intercession is not us deciding what we should pray. Just like worship isn't really us deciding what to worship, but we worship in the Spirit. The Spirit gives us our worship. The, the Spirit 
enables us to fix our focus on Jesus and he inspires that which is to rise up from within us and be expressed through us. So it is with prayer. We do not know how to pray as we ought. We do not know how to intercede as we ought. But the Holy Spirit will enable us to intercede with the intercession of Jesus. Any believers here this morning? So, what else can we see here in Hebrews 7? Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So, you've heard me say often that salvation is something that God has accomplished, but it's also a process. So, God, Jesus, in heaven, is constantly interceding for you. Because you as someone who uh, has been saved, so he's constantly praying to the Father for your sake, for your benefit. We'll see what he's praying for you in a minute. Now, why is he doing that? Or why is he able to do that? Because the next verse says, such a high priest meets our need. So the fact that he intercedes for you means that every need of yours can be met. Not because you are praying to him because you believe every need, but because he is ahead of you in the game. He's interceding for you. You need to be intercession, not trying to initiate an intercession of your own. Are you there? Such a high priest meets our need one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Okay, what has God done already for you to make it possible for you to intercede with Jesus? Precisely that. He has made you holy. He has sanctified you. He has washed you of your sins. He's made you blameless in his sight. He has set you apart from sinners. You're no longer a sinner. Now you're called to live as one of his children. He has exalted you so that you are seated in heavenly places. So to enable you to share with him in his intercession, he has had to do in you what was necessary in him so that he could be our savior and so that he could intercede for all those who are being saved. Are we there? So, we do not determine the prayer agenda. Jesus does that. We join in with what he's doing. Just as we join in with the worship of heaven, worship doesn't begin in heaven because we start to sing praises. It's going on all the time. (coughs) Intercession, Jesus is interceding all the time before the Father. So we join in his intercession. Now we have in John 17 what is often called the high priestly prayer. Why is it called that? Because what Jesus is doing for the disciples, is giving them revelation of how he will intercede for them once he has returned to the Father. So chapter 17 of John's Gospel actually tells us how Jesus is interceding, what he is praying. Therefore, if we are to join with him in his intercession, then we will be praying in similar manner. And we will see how he prays about himself, about us, and about others who need to come to know him. So he's always interceding, he's always standing in the gap between sinful humanity and the Father. He's praying 
for more and more people to take hold of the salvation that he has won through the cross. He is then praying for all those who have actually turned to him with repentance and faith. So what does he actually pray? Well, I'm just going to pick out the salient points rather than just read through the whole prayer. He starts by saying, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Now, while Jesus was on earth, first of all, teaching about the kingdom, then allowing his body to become that sacrifice through which all mankind could be saved. Everything he was doing, as we know well, was for the glory of the Father. Everything was for the glory of the Father. (coughs) Excuse me, he wasn't drawing attention to himself. He would speak only the words his Father gave him to speak, because that glorified the Father. He could do nothing himself, he said. He could do only the things he saw his Father doing. Why? Because... His whole intent was to glorify the Father. So everything he said and did was to glorify the Father. So now it's coming to the time of the cross. What's he going to do? Glorify the Father. Having become our salvation and returned to heaven, what is his future going to be to glorify the Father? But you see, what you see in in God is three persons, and this is why we talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because there's interrelationship going on all the time in God. The Father is glorifying the Son, the Son is glorifying the Father, and the Holy Spirit lives in people in order that they may glorify the Son and glorify the Father. So the Father is one with the Son, and the Son is one with the Father, And those in whom Jesus lives and who live in him are one with him and therefore one with the Father. And all this glorifies God. This is the unity that Jesus has made possible. Even during the days of his humanity, he maintained his unity with the Father. But what he did was to draw those who would become disciples, those who would become believers into that same unity. So they would become one with him, with Jesus. That means that they would also become one with the Father. And that means that they would also be one with each other. They would be one with everybody else who was one with Jesus and one with the Father. So we are going to see that the climax of this prayer is the prayer for unity. Unity with the Father, unity with the Son, unity with one another. Jesus is constantly interceding for that. But before he comes to that point, there are other ways in which he is praying and interceding for those who have become believers. So he prays, first of all, for those who have been his disciples. And he he says this, I'm not praying for the world but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. In other words, Jesus is saying, nobody could belong to me, nobody could be living in me, unless they were given to me by the Father. And because they're given to me by the Father to live in me, to work in me, to work through me, and for me to work through them, I am constantly praying to the Father for them. I'm constantly thankful to the Father for them. So Jesus is still dependent upon the will of the Father to call, to choose people, to come into that saving grace of his, to be made one with him. And Jesus, therefore, continues to pray for them, continues to be thankful for them. What does he pray for them? Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. So, okay, take this personally for yourself for a moment. Just as one believer, it's true for every other believer as well. So don't get too proud about it, but be thankful for it. So 
God the Father has taken hold of you and put you into Jesus. Jesus is thankful for you and he prays to the Father for you because you are a gift to him from the Father. And he prays that the Father will always protect you because you have to live out the life of the kingdom in an alien world where there's a lot of opposition to the gospel, a lot of hatred uh, of Jesus and so on. You live under that constant protection because Jesus is interceding for you continuously. Remember, Jesus lives in eternity, so he doesn't have a prayer time. He doesn't clock on for one hour and then clock off again. He is day and night continually interceding for you. So he is continually interceding for your protection. Then he, <clears throat> he says that he prays that they, you, me, all those who become disciples, will have the full measure of God's joy in them. Now, you, you, you know that uh, it was the anointing of the oil of joy that raised Jesus above his companions. The thing that marked Jesus off from other people more than anything else is joy. And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Because Jesus is constantly interceding for you in heaven before the Father that your joy will be full, that the anointing of joy will be upon you, that the mantle of joy will be upon you. God doesn't want joyless worship, joyless praise, or even joyless prayer. He is the Lord of joy, and we are to rejoice always. So if we go back to what we were saying at the beginning, God is going to answer everything we pray in his name. To pray in his name is going to be linked what it means to speak in his name and to act in his name. It's a package of how we're living what does that look like in practice? We rejoice always. We pray constantly because we're living in Jesus, the intercessor who is praying constantly. And we give thanks in all circumstances because Jesus is still interceding for us, praying for our protection, praying for our joy. Now, when you walk in loving obedience to the Lord, you are filled with joy. When you're in disobedience, the first thing that happens is you lose your peace and you lose your joy. Hello? When you start looking at yourself, you lose your joy. Because actually you're not a very joyful subject. But Jesus is the Lord of joy. You keep your eyes on him and you will be filled with joy. It doesn't say rejoice always, but rejoice in the Lord always. Because your joy is in the Lord. So there is Jesus interceding for the Father He's praying for you. He's praying for your protection. He's praying for the fullness of joy in your life. So what are you going to do when you join in his intercession? Well, you're going to be praying for those who are in darkness to lay hold of the salvation that he has um, made possible because just because it's made possible doesn't mean it's going to happen in people unless they are prayed into that position. Then you're going to pray for the Lord to protect them, to keep them from the evil one. You're going to pray for the fullness of joy to come into their lives. See, this is how to intercede in the way that Jesus intercedes. Amen? You're going to intercede that people will rejoice always and pray constantly and give thanks in all circumstances. Of course, this is what God wants in you as well as in others. Then he, he prays, Sanctify them by the truth. Make them holy. Keep them walking in holiness. So Jesus here before the Father, he's, he's thankful because you have been saved, because the Father's given you to live in him, and that can only be because you have been saved. So he's praying for your protection. He's praying for your joy. He's praying that you will be sanctified, that you will live that holy life that will glorify him. What is the holy life? Well, it's to live like Jesus lived here on earth. 
And therefore, it's to be dependent upon the life of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. Why does the Holy Spirit live within you? To enable you to live that holy life. And therefore, to stand against whatever is unholy and ungodly and is opposed to the will and purpose of God. So Jesus is constantly interceding for you, for your protection, for your joy, for your sanctification. Hallelujah. Jesus sees that as a process that takes place through the word of truth. As you believe the word of truth and you put the word of truth into action, so that holiness of life, that obedience to the Lord, the qualities of his life, his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, kindness, goodness, so on, all those qualities are being uh, manifested in your life. But also, you see, an essential part of that is that you are not living for yourself, but you're living to make the gospel known to those who are lost. Because the whole of the intercession of Jesus begins at that point. That the redemption, the salvation that he has made possible actually will affect, will come into the lives of more and more people. They will come out of the darkness into the light. Having done that, then he prays in this way for them. That they will be protected, they will be full of joy, that they will be sanctified. Then you see he's opening his prayer not only to the original disciples but to all those who will become believers in the future. And that's when he begins to pray, now may they all be one. May they be one with me, may they be one with the Father, may they be one with us, may they be one with each other. Doing what? Well, praying for the salvation of souls, praying, protecting, loving, caring for one another, praying that joy into one another's lives. When, when one is down, the others around him pick him up and get him refocused on the Lord so that the joy of the Lord becomes his strength. Being one together as God's holy people. When I show myself holy through you, the world will believe. That's what Jesus said. That's what the word of God says. It's what the promise that we receive in, in uh, Ezekiel. That the nations will know that I am the Lord when I show myself holy through you. Praise God. So all this, all this is, is happening. Jesus is constantly praying that. And then he's, he's praying that they will... In all this, of course, know the love of the Father. That, that, you ha that the Father has loved them even as he has loved Jesus when he was on earth. And that that same love for Jesus, the Father's love for Jesus, will be in them. So he's constantly interceding for you. Not only that you will be protected, not only that you will be full of joy, not only that you will live that holy life, but he's also praying that you will have the, f the Father's love for Jesus living in you. And then, he prays also that you will know his glory. Not only now, but for all eternity. So that you will be with him where he is for all eternity. Now, beloved one, ever since you came to the Lord, Jesus has been praying like that to the Father for you. Because he prays for you in that way doesn't make you instantly, perfectly obedient. Doesn't mean that you're always joyful. Doesn't mean that you will always walk in holiness. Doesn't mean that you will always act in love or you will always demonstrate the Father's love for the Son. Why? Because you are still a free agent, you still have your free will, and it's still for you to respond to God in whatever way you choose. He's never going to force you. 
but he's praying all the right things for you. So when you join with him in his intercession, you're not joining with him just in his prayer for you, but mindful of the fact that he's praying in that way for every other one. So you see, we saw in Hebrews that in the intercession of Jesus is the answer to every need, including your healing, your provision, whatever else. So when you pray, you're not asking Jesus to initiate something on your behalf. but you actually appreciate the way he is ahead of you in the game. He's already praying for you in all these ways. And you join in with thanksgiving. Now you can understand why Jesus says that whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. Why? Because I'm already interceding for you so that you can receive it. I'm ahead of you in it. Now at last you're joining with me in what I've been praying for you even before you thought of praying for it. So instead of thinking, oh Lord, where are you? Are you going to do this, that and the other for me? You thank him, Lord, I thank you that you're interceding for me. I thank you that you are praying for me. I thank you for your protection. I thank you that you're praying for my holiness. Thank you that you're praying for my joy. Thank you that you're praying for my healing. Thank you that you're praying for my provision. Thank you that you're praying for, for me to know your glory. Thank you that you're praying for me that, that I would know the Father's love for the Son. See, this transforms your prayer life when you realize this. You've heard me say that in revival, people pray for hours. I, I, I can remember, I used to say, you know, outside of revival, you pray for five minutes and it seems like an hour. When you're in revival, you pray for an hour and it seems like five minutes. That's the difference. Why, why when the Spirit of God comes in revival power, do People pray for three, four, five hours without any effort. The answer to that is because they're so close to Jesus, they're just interceding with him. You wouldn't even be able to think of what to pray for for five hours. I had to stop the housewives at some time because they were praying for more than five hours. I say, you mustn't neglect all your household duties and so on because they wanted to pray more than anything else. That has to be God, doesn't it? Nobody, nobody can create that within themselves. But you see, this is what was happening. They were living so, because this is what you do in, in revival, is simply living much closer to Jesus than you lived before. But when you live that close to Jesus, you're joining in what he's doing. And all the time he's interceding. Praying all the time. Never ceases. And he'll continue to intercede for you, for all of us, until the Father says, okay, son, now you go back. Then the intercession will stop and the judgment will begin. So this is a wonderful message because it's the word of God. But you see, if we take on board what God is teaching us this morning, it's going to transform our prayer life. We may not at this moment feel moved to pray for three, four, five hours a day. I'm not asking you to try to do that. Don't do that. You, but you see, it has to be the Holy Spirit working in us to enable us to do whatever God wants us to do. So you see, Jesus ends this prayer by saying, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. 
And they know, all the believers, they know that you have sent me. That I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So, if you've never really realized, appreciated it before, you can thank God that <clears throat> even if you have sometimes missed your times of prayer, he has never missed his time of prayer for you, ever. That he prays for you continually, constantly. And he's given you the greatest of all privileges to join him in his prayer. Not to try to initiate a prayer of your own but to join with him. You can see, once we've grasped this truth, how Jesus could say, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be open. There's no if, but, or maybe. This is what will happen for everyone. I can remember when I first got revelation of all this, many years ago now. For a whole period of time, for, for years, I knew that I was living in a place with God where I knew it would be impossible for me to pray for anything without it being answered. I just knew every prayer I prayed would be answered. It would be impossible to pray without being answered. I'm not quite back in that place, but I believe God is wanting me and you to come into such a place. Because this is, this is what he's promising. Whatever you pray in my name. Now you see, before, remember we, the scripture we read right at the beginning, until that moment they had not prayed in his name. They couldn't because they weren't living in him. They weren't abiding in him. Jesus hadn't made the sacrifice for them that would make that possible. So they couldn't pray in his name. They couldn't do anything in his name. But now, they are branches in the vine. They live in him. So they can speak in his name. They can act in his name. They can pray in his name. They can intercede in his name. If you speak in his name, you speak what he gives you to speak. If you act in his name, you do what he tells you to do. If you pray in his name, the Holy Spirit is giving you the prayer, is showing you how Jesus is interceding in that situation. So one more thing. How is this actually going to work in your experience? Through one little word, faith. See, if you don't believe this, it won't work for you. You believe, you intercede with Jesus. See what happens to your prayer life. It's your ability to hear God and to see how God works in you and through you. See how you have a tremendous responsibility from God. I'll show you what that is. 
You see, Jesus is interceding before the Father for all of us in this room, for millions and billions of others at the same time, you understand. But he's praying for each one of us. Every person in this room has a different of responsibility because you have a different set of relationships. Uh, you don't know a lot of people I know and I don't know a lot of people that you know. But to intercede, to join with Jesus in his intercession, is to have the responsibility to pray the blessings of God down upon your circle of relationships. Wherever you have influence. So God gives you those people, not just family, not just friends, but wherever you have relationship, wherever you have influence, God gives you the privilege and the responsibility to pray the blessings of God for those people. Even those that don't know God to pray them into the kingdom of God like he does. He's done the work of salvation, but now he intercedes that that work of salvation will become effective in more and more of those who are still living in darkness and need to come out of that darkness into the glorious light of his kingdom. This is a different world from coming before God in prayer and thinking about yourself and thinking about your feelings and thinking about your problems. and uh, You know, because Christians often, uh, all they do is talk about themselves and then say amen at the end. And they think, they think that's prayer. That's not prayer. That's being idiotic. <laughs> I mean, prayer is to join with the intercession of Jesus. Why think about yourself? He knows more about the situation than you do. Why just talk about the problem and problem and problem and problem? He said, I know, I know, I know, but what do you believe me to do about it? See, that's prayer, what you believe God to do, but what you believe him to do because of what he's done and because of what he is already praying for you. Hallelujah. So, beloved one, are you ready? If any two of you agree concerning anything, it will be done by my Father in heaven. What happens if Jesus and you agree? What happens if your prayer agrees with what Jesus is praying for you? I mean, don't you believe the Father will answer every prayer of Jesus? Hello? Don't you believe, therefore, if your prayer agrees with his prayer, your prayer is going to get answered? Wow. This opens up all kinds of new possibilities, doesn't it? Let's get to our feet, come into the middle. Hallelujah. We're going to have some very powerful prayer times this week. We're going to have, you know, powerful encounter times. We're going to have powerful times of intercession. Because we realize, I'm not the one standing in the gap. Jesus is standing in the gap. But I'm standing or living in him. In the one who's standing in the gap. Hallelujah. I can only intercede because I'm living in the intercessor. Come on, let's praise him, shall we? Praise him. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Basta calaria, letto papa papara, sandaria, letto papa para, sotaria, letto papa carasi. Papa papara, sandaria, letto papa papara, sandaria, letto. Coralaba sandaria, letto papa papara, sitari sandu. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Papa para, sandaria, letto papa papara, sandaria. Papa para sandaria leto papa pa kala sotaria sandaria. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now thank Jesus for his salvation. Come on, thank him that he has saved you. He has brought you out of darkness into light. Because the Father, listen to me, the Father gave you to Jesus. Listen. In response to his intercession. See, he intercedes for people to lay hold of that salvation. In answer to his prayer, God the Father, taken hold of your life and put you in Christ Jesus. You are an answer to prayer. Hallelujah. Why don't you thank the Lord for that? Jesus would have prayed that all who were predestined by the Father would come to him and be saved. Hallelujah. You're, you're one of the answers to his prayer. He prayed you into the kingdom. Now thank him that ever since you came into Christ, ever since you became a believer, He's been praying for you. Day and night, he intercedes for you. Before the Father. Come on, thank him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank him that he's prayed for your protection. He's kept you from the evil one. He's kept you for himself, kept you for the Father. Right? that you may glorify the Father and the Father may be glorified in you. Hallelujah. How wonderful, 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 wonderful. Praise you, Jesus. He's prayed for your joy to be full. Hallelujah. That you would keep walking with him in his love, in his grace, in his mercy, so that your joy is always full. Can you pray, praise him for that? Can you thank him? Thank you, Lord, that you are always interceding for me, that my joy will be full. You said, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Thank you that you want me to rejoice always. Thank you that you're praying for that, you're interceding for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Lord, I thank you that you forgive me for my joylessness, times when I've become preoccupied with myself and been downcast and downhearted, when all the time, if I only was aware of what you are doing, I'd realize you want my joy to be full. Praise you, Lord. You want me be, to be rejoicing in you always. Praise your holy name. Thank you. Interesting, the order in which these things come. Praise for your protection. Praise for your joy. Hallelujah. Now he prays for your sanctification. Praise for you to be holy. Praise for you to be transformed into his likeness. With everything. He's praying for that for you. Can you thank him for that? It's not going to happen by your effort, but he's praying for you. And the Spirit lives within you, right? And the Spirit does only what he hears. So the Spirit hears Jesus praying for your sanctification, for your holiness, for your transformation of life. Hallelujah. The Son and the Spirit are working together to bring that about in your life for the glory of the Father. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Lord, I can't transform myself. I can't change myself. But I thank you that you are doing it by the power of your spirit. Thank you that you're praying for that all the time, day and night. You're praying for me, Lord. Hallelujah. You're interceding for me. Thank you that your blood is washing me and cleansing me again and again, purifying me, making me pure, holy, blameless in your sight. Praise your holy name. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, thank, and thank him that he's praying that the Father's love for the Son might be in you. Oh, that you would love him like the Father loves him. Come on, he's praying that for you. Oh, Father, thank you. You've not only poured your love into my heart by the Holy Spirit, but you're praying that, that the Father's love for the Son might be, that I will love you just like the Father does. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Day and night you're praying this for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Now thank him for the sphere of influence he's given you. For all those relationships that you have, the people that you know, the people around you, those that you interrelate with. Hallelujah. Join with Jesus in his intercession for them. Lord, protect them. Fill them with your joy. Continuing your, your transforming work of sanctification in them, Lord. Continue to move in their lives that their love for you will increase, that they will have the Father's love for the Son. And for any that don't know you, Lord, that they will come to lay hold of the redemption that you have won through the sacrifice of your blood on the cross. That all of them, Lord, saved and unsaved, would come to know your glory. That they would be one with the Father, one with the Son, and one with each other. So come on, let's pray for that unity now. Jesus constantly prays. You know, the devil always tries to counteract that, praise by, by, that prayer by causing disunity and division. But Jesus is praying, Father, may they be one. Father, may they be one. Hallelujah. So the world will know that you have sent me and that you love them even as you have loved me. Are you praying this? Hallelujah. Thank him for the unity. Now thank you for all the prayer promises, especially this one that we've been focusing on this morning. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Come on, thank him. That's a promise to you personally. Because you're a branch in the vine. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus said of the disciples, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Some of you might feel like that this morning. Wow, now I understand what it really means to pray in the name of Jesus, to join in his intercession. I haven't done that before. Well, this is a new, a new day, isn't it? It's a new season. It's what lies ahead of you that is important, not what lies behind you. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the spirit of prayer. That we want that spirit of prayer to constantly be upon us, motivating our prayer, filling our prayer, 
making our prayer powerful and effective so that whatever we ask the Father in the name of Jesus, we shall indeed see happen. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So can you just tell the Lord now that you want to always speak and act in his name, that whatever you do in word or deed, you do all in the name of the Lord Jesus so that you can then pray in the name of Jesus. You can't detach your prayer life from the rest of your life, you see. You can't live in one way and then pray in another way. It's all a package. It's all a whole. The person that you are is the one who prays. So there's absolute consistency in Jesus. He always spoke in the name of the Father, acted in the name of the Father, prayed in the name of the Father. So with you, hallelujah. You speak in the name of Jesus, you act in the name of Jesus, you pray in the name of Jesus. And he's given you his Holy Spirit to enable that. So can you thank him that he has made it possible for you to rejoice always, to pray constantly, to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I think it needs to be a bit noisier now if we're thanking the Lord for this. <laughs> praise you, praise you, Lord. Bless your holy name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Kora la pa sandaria leto pa 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 para sandaria leto pa 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 kalasi nama pa pa para sandaria leto pa 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 kalasi tri sandama pa pa para sandaria leto pa pa kalasi nama Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Pa 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 para sandaria leno ma sandama si nama. Hallelujah. Now. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, he actually reveals to us what Jesus is praying for because he always prays according to the will of God. So where has this idea of breakthrough and breakout come from? Because actually it was revelation that was brought to different Kingdom faith churches all at the same time, quite independently of one another. So this is what Jesus is praying for. And as far as I'm concerned, if Jesus is praying for this, it's got to happen. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to make something happen. Right? Jesus will cause it to happen. So can we thank him for more breakthrough? Because we've already had quite a lot of breakthrough, haven't we, in the last couple of weeks. And much more breakout. The life of the kingdom breaking out from amongst us. Come on, let's really pray. Pray in the spirit now. Papa papa pa kara sandaria lero papa pa kara si tri sandama O papa pa para sandaria lero papa pa kara si tri sandama O papa pa para la do para si nama O papa pa para sandaria lero papa pa pa kara si tri sandama Thank you thank you thank you Jesus Thank you thank you thank you Jesus So Jesus said at the same time as he said all these other things so when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Breakthrough, breakout. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, 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 thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the intercession of Jesus. Thank you that he is our great high priest today. Hallelujah, 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 who constantly makes intercession for us. 
Kora la pa sandalia leto pa 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 kala sinama. Pa pa para sandalia leto pa 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 para sitari sandama. Pa 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 para sandalia leto pa 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 para sitari sandarama sinama. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Come on. We're going to finish with a great, great shout of glory to the Lord. A great burst of praise. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources from Kingdom Faith and our other audio and video podcasts, please visit www.kingdomfaith.com.